Welcome to the lovely and beautiful Waterloo Park. Today, we're going to go through my checklist for wedding photography. And well, there are, it's, it's a PDF and it's also a document that you can edit in Word or Open Office or whatever it might be. And the basic idea is that it gives a good outline and a good idea of all of the shots that you should probably be getting on a wedding day. But obviously tailor this list to, to yourself and your couples and, and maybe highlight the things that you might suspect that you might forget uh, when you're actually out there in the field. Again, there is no official 100% correct way to shoot a wedding. There's really only one I would say maybe a couple of shots that you absolutely have to have. The one is just a couple arm around each other, smiling, facing the camera, full length. And that is, I would say, the, the most important shot of a wedding. That's the one that, if you don't have it, the mother or the bride's gonna be upset, the, the grandma's gonna be upset, mother or the groom's gonna send you an email. So make sure, above all things, you just get that, that super boring, boring shot. And something that you should know is that there are 100 spots available at the founder rate. If you're not familiar with what the founder rate is, uh, basically the way that when I started Patreon three years ago, uh, if you got in at the very beginning, you got in at a, a, an aggressively discounted rate based on what, what it was going to be over time. Uh, and that is available again because I've moved everything from Patreon to a new website. And you can get in, founder rate is $6.58 per month if you sign up for the annual, which is the best deal in all of wedding photography education, 100% hands down, absolutely. Uh, there's so much on there, so so click over there and actually see all the content that you can get because it is, it is quite a lot. You'll get all my presets, 2020 pack of presets just came out that's included as well as introvert's guide to wedding photography posing and off-camera flash and all the book more weddings courses my pricing course and um, also all the how to travel the world for nearly free courses which are kind of focused around basically getting you break-even travel and right now you might be saying like travel seems a little bit crazy but what's actually going to be happening is well everything is in a dip right now uh, travel companies really do need to get people traveling again so they're at the upswing on the other side it's going to be a lot of marketing opportunities that you can take advantage of you want to go out you want to see the world you want to fly first class you want to make all your wildest dreams come true um, to some degree it's it's kind of a legitimate offer it's not I know Pedro says it and Napoleon Dynamite but uh, it is there is legitimacy to to that offer so check that out if you're interested in getting one of the first 100 spots once they're gone they're gone forever and the price goes up so uh, get into that right now if you're interested please don't please don't resell it as your own other than that feel free to use it modify it change it up make it make it your own send it to your couples so they can get an idea or they can add anything or uh, you could even go as far as to, at least for the family photo section, send them kind of the family photo list and get them to actually plug names in or add extra families or whatever it might be. I think one thing that really has sped up my workflow when it comes to just doing the, the family session or maybe not workflow, on location workflow, is having an idea of all of the people that they want captured. So rather than just me being like, all right, uh, let's put the, the parents together and with the couple and now separate. And, and you have more of an idea of that, okay, so parents are separated so they're gonna want this family and this family and then also maybe another family is super important and they want to make sure they get a photo with them and the, they want to make sure that they get a photo with maybe not a grandmother but somebody that was a, a important part of their life they want to invite them to the the family photo session because they're considered family there's a lot of variables that go into what the actual family session is so the more clarity you can have going in the easier it's going to make your job overall uh, another thing that I mentioned in the in the past uh, couple of videos here is that if you have somebody that actually knows who everyone is and they can just call out names, they make your life a heck of a lot easier. Uh, as long as the situation calls for it, if you're at a very high-end wedding and it feels weird to ask the, for the help of a sister of a bride or something like that, um, by all means, maybe ask the wedding planner or the assistant wedding planner. One of them are usually willing to step in in a situation like that. But I would say most of the time for pretty much all the weddings that I do, it is not a, a strange request at all to have somebody, a cousin who knows who everyone is calling out names during the family session. and that that way you make sure you get everything and also that the family session doesn't spiral completely out of control which does actually have a tendency to happen that if you don't have a firm list that list is going to keep growing as a new aunt shows up and she's like oh we should do a photo with with you and now she's now the set director and pulling families together that maybe the couple doesn't actually want photos with that maybe that's an extended family group shot that you're going to do at the reception and uh, they're just kind of making that family session their own and, and slowing you down and stopping you from getting to the part where you just take photos of the two of them which are I would say more valuable on the day that the 
uh, the extended family photos you can kind of find and do those wherever but uh, for photos of them if you're chasing a sunset or racing the sunset or whatever it might be uh, it's it's important to get the timeline moving on to get the couple and again kind of my core value is to get them back to the actual wedding day and experiencing their wedding day so the faster I can do that if I have a list of all the family photos I have a, a delegated relative that knows kind of who everyone is and is is loud and willing to call out names uh, that takes a lot of pressure off of me because I personally I don't really love to just yell names of people and also pronunciation I get really nervous whenever I look at a name I'm like I have no idea how to pronounce that uh, this way somebody else has to deal with it and they're usually a lot more equipped and qualified to do such thing so let's uh, let's begin this is kind of a full full wedding day walkthrough I would almost say getting ready um, the first thing that I do when I arrive, this goes for both photo and video coverage, is that I get a shot of the exterior. If you have a drone, good good opening uh, for video for sure is, is a drone shot. I feel like to open the gallery with a very strong image, so if you were to, to do the drone shot there, if they live at a nice house with some, some nice green space around, get that drone up and really start the gallery off like the, with the, the greatest photo that just kind of sets all the quality, the best photo that they've ever seen of their house or their, their mom's house or whatever it might be. Um, location exterior, always the first image. I try not to overdo it. Uh, and then I guess overall, this kind of goes for all the locations that I'll, I'll find myself at during the wedding day. But uh, really, I spend a lot of time making sure that I capture all the details that have been brought in by somebody or that they've set up. I want to make sure that like 100% all of that is captured. So that goes across the board. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But when arriving to the house, if they've decorated the front or they've um, usually what happens is whoever is in charge of the garden will do an extra great job for a long period of time uh, cultivating that garden so that it's amazing on the wedding day. Uh, and if that's the case, if you get some great photos of that garden, the father of the bride or father of the groom or whoever it might be, it's going to be really excited about your the fact that you noticed that and that you documented that. So keep an eye open. Take things a little bit slower than you would. Don't rush into it and be like, ah, I gotta get like these hundred photos. Give yourself some extra time. People usually don't care if you show up a little bit early to just kind of start working and start doing that. So next up, the dress hanging. I've had some requests that my couples just don't really care about this shot anymore, which is awesome. Um, I don't love doing the dress hanging shot. I find that it's um, it personally scares me. If I was in an environment like this and they're like, oh yeah, take the dress and like go put it somewhere nice. It's like one it's always gonna look weird just hanging in a tree and two if that dress gets pooped on or if it gets a grass stain I'm liable for it so I don't really I do my best to avoid that and I feel like a lot of my couples are coming around to that as well that they're really just not into as many detail shots anymore as I feel like everyone used to be a couple of years ago so I kind of get that out of them or I get the feeling for it when the, we actually have the first meeting or the first phone call and um, by that point usually I can get a sense of kind of what their needs and wants are. If they don't want that shot, I'm not going to do that shot for them. Uh, I get the shot of the dress once it's on on the bride or brides, I guess. Um, we're going to talk in, I guess, traditionally kind of male-female, but also this is totally applicable if it's a same-sex wedding of kind of either side. So uh, yeah, dress hanging shot, I don't know. I don't love it, but it's kind of one of those things that a lot of people believe that they have to have um, and then the other thing is that it's very difficult to actually set up that shot a lot of the time that if you're in a hotel room there's never a place to hang a dress like there's no you can't hang it anywhere usually and you have to ask for help and you got to go out in the hall and hang it or take it outside it's um, a thing that I'm, I'm cool if it just kind of stops happening all the other details um, such as jewelry shoes ring shots um, all of that pretty much anything that they have at the at the getting ready location. If they have all the rings, I'm gonna do that ring shot then. If they don't have all the rings, if the guys have some of them and then she, uh, the bride has her engagement ring on, in that case, usually what I do is I take the rings over dinner for just a brief moment. And then another thing that I just never really leave the sight of them uh, when I'm actually doing those shots. I feel like that's another kind of key thing for, again, managing my just kind of stress, anxiety, and liability as well. Don't do anything too crazy with the rings. I've heard some stories. I've, I know a dude that actually uh, or dropped a, a ring down the, kind of like this here. It went down there, but it was a, a deck and it went underneath. And then all of a sudden they had to pull up a, a board to get back to, the, to actually get the ring. So I would say aim on the air of 
maybe not doing as creative and amazing shot as you possibly could and just getting it done and getting it prof looking professional. Uh, you can also bring things like even your cell phone, if you were to have your phone like this where it gets that nice reflective surface and you have the rings on here, you get really nice and close to the macro, uh, you can get some great shots just off of that reflective surface as well. So maybe something to think about that you don't gotta go too far, you just gotta find some, some good light and a phone. Um, and then my personal, uh, approach for this is usually using a 35 millimeter lens. My 35 millimeter Tamron f 1.8 is it. It's not a macro, but it can get close enough. So for invitation shots, even for ring shots, I'm totally happy to use it. So uh, maybe something to think about if you don't want to carry around an extra thing in your bag all the day, um, just to get kind of that one ring shot, uh, or leave it in your car. Maybe I don't know in the trunk. Maybe that's a s solution. But I like having the 35 because it's almost a macro in most cases. Um, wedding invitations, any other details that you see in that room, uh, really just kind of make an effort to photograph it. I think from, I guess, my standpoint as a, a random new stranger to enter the room, I always start with details so that people can get comfortable to the fact that I'm just kind of hanging out there and that I actually, that I'm the photographer and that, that I exist. I'm not going to walk into a room and just immediately, like if somebody's half done their makeup and just start like grabbing photos of them from really close. I feel like that just kind of sets everyone off on the wrong foot and it's a bit weird. What I would recommend is you show up, you start doing detail shots kind of within the room or within the view of everyone else uh, to for them to get comfortable with the fact that there's a photographer here that's now just gonna be creeping on them throughout the rest of the day. I feel like that's the easiest way to kind of bridge the, the awkward stage into the relationship. And by the time you start taking photos of them, they've, they're already familiar with you. They already know who you are. You've probably already had a conversation or they've overheard a conversation and they're gonna be a little bit more open and a little bit more natural and, and more themselves, which I think is the goal overall. If flowers are there, I'm always doing flower photos. That includes corsages and really kind of anything else that they brought in there. And then same thing as outside, that if there's anything that they've done, if they've decorated the, the railing, the banister that goes upstairs, I'm gonna take some photos of that for the for the grandma or the ma, whoever, whoever did that. Uh, and just kind of keep an eye open and just make sure you're capturing kind of absolutely everything. Uh, once the, I guess the other thing is um, that you're there to kind of capture some of the hair and makeup. My personal stance is don't worry too hard about catching like the hair and makeup artists as soon as they begin. I always want those last photos of them. So basically like as soon as they're completely finished all their makeup, I'll actually ask the makeup artist to just like go in with a brush and just do some extra powder or whatever it might be um, so that I can actually get the photo when everything is 100% complete. No one really wants that like half done makeup look or half done hair look. Uh, maybe some people do, but I've noticed that most of my clients don't really care too much about that. Uh, as far as videos go, kind of same deal that I 100% am conscious about making sure that the first time the bride or the groom uh, or the brides and the grooms are in a video clip that they are looking their absolute best. So I'm not including anything of them looking kind of like half done or um, in clothes that aren't their, their wedding attire. Uh, I really do wait for that reveal. Uh, to do, I guess, you can kind of subtly play with it if you're doing video. There's a lot to learn if you're doing video, but there are ways you can kind of tease at it with photos. I think it's fine to include them, but um, end of the day, I'm probably not going to be putting them, they're not going to be a blog post item or anything like that. One shot that I do like to get is uh, wherever the dress is hanging, usually the bride taking the dress down. I feel like I, d I don't love the shot of just the dress hanging, but when it's actually being interacted with by the, the bride or whoever is about to wear it, or even the groom kind of pulling the suit down, I feel like at that point it becomes a much better image overall and definitely for video something that actually plays well on video uh, and then also getting the detail shots of kind of the, the dress and everything like that as well like just up close shots um, they help add to the video content at least to kind of get people into the the initial introductory phase of the video and then also they're just nice to have and you don't always hear the full story of absolutely everything on the wedding day. So there are some times that I've caught details that, are, that people are just so excited that I, that I happened to notice that. And I had no idea that the backstory was that like that patch of lace was from her grandmother's dress or whatever it might have been. But just being conscious, aware, and just kind of capturing everything that you possibly can. I think it's important also um, during this entire process to also be grabbing as many candids as you possibly can of all the wedding party. And uh, when we eventually get to the groom's place, like same deal, like just making sure that if somebody's in good light, if they're looking happy that you're getting a photo or two of them. 
Uh, and then also, I feel like the collaborative nature of the getting ready section of the day is also very important. So uh, rather than like, even if a bride is totally capable of putting her jewelry on herself, I'm still gonna ask her mom or a bridesmaid or maid of honor, somebody to help out. And you can kind of cycle through it so that if, if they have maybe three or four bridesmaids, come up with some sort of small task for each of them. So maybe somebody helps specifically with earrings and somebody helps with the necklace and somebody helps put the the final like lace on the dress or whatever it might be uh, that you can usually find a job for everyone and that way everyone feels included everybody's in the gallery it's kind of nice uh, and then my I guess as a guy usually what I do is um, once I know that the bride's going to be getting into her dress I basically just like she closes the door and I just say like hey let me in whenever you're kind of three quarters done um, same deal as kind of the makeup that I don't really need if it's a lace up back I don't need the shots of like just none of that being done up because it's just kind of a weird mess of of lace and fabric uh, once things are a little bit more complete is usually when I come in to grab those shots uh, so I don't mind just coming in quickly I feel like um, I guess my my shyness also here that if I can come in and I can do just like walk in and just start doing a lot of photos I feel a lot more comfortable so if I'm coming in at the time that I know that I actually need to take those photos I feel a lot better about being there whereas if I come in at the very beginning I feel like I'm just kind of it's like uncomfortable time almost that I take a few photos and then I'm just kind of taking photos for no reason for a little while waiting to get to the time that uh, is actually kind of the most important um, also when you get in there make sure that everybody's smiling and, and somewhat happy while actually doing the task because people have a tendency especially with like if they're doing the, the crochet clip and doing the hooks they're kind of like all angry at it uh, so just get people to remind her relax smile um, take a take a somewhat nice photo while you're in here um, same with shoes get somebody else to to help with the shoes and uh, make sure that everyone's nice and included at this point usually I roll into a few portraits just with the bride or just with her bride and her mom if her mom was the one putting her kind of in her dress or maid of honor whoever it might be um, there are some optionals at this point where if you have the space and you're able to do it I might do a group shot if I have the space and the time and everyone is in good light. Uh, I might take this as a moment to do individuals with everyone or individuals with the bride and each of her, her girls or, and or guys if they're on the side. Um, simply because this is like their hair and makeup has just been completed. So if I can capture that, like that's the 100% like at that moment. So I'm happy to get that. Same with bridal portraits, I think are also important to get at this time as well. Um, and usually the way that that works is I just find a window and just kind of like rotate near it and just kind of play around with the lighting uh, and just do some very simple, basic portraits. Um, and usually the, the room also has significance. Sometimes it's a hotel room, but a lot of the time it's it's her mom's room or her, her childhood bedroom or something like that, or their, their current bedroom. Uh, so there's always a little bit of significance. So I, I don't mind doing the photos kind of within that that space right there uh, and then I do my best to have some sort of reveal if all the girls or all the bridal party isn't in there that when we exit the room I want to get everyone's reaction really quickly uh, or if they're coming into the room usually they're doing it kind of like one at a time and I'm just very conscious when a new person's entering the room and just grabbing that reaction as soon as it happens moving into the the guys side of things um, a little more chill I feel like a lot more goes into the ladies preparation than the, the groom side preparation but still things to capture uh, things like cufflinks ties socks shoes really anything that kind of goes into the the wedding day the suit uh, as well as a if they have invitations or they have all the rings which sometimes the guys do um, just making sure that you're aware of kind of just capturing all those details um, and then I also go through and just kind of get as many candid photos of each individual of the person that's kind of there whether it's family or whether it's groomsmen or uh, wedding party I'm always doing my best to get a couple good candidates of everyone kind of from that situation it's my goal overall I'll speak to this um, maybe later in the list but it really is my goal to make sure that I get at least one good image of every single person that is at the wedding uh, I think that this is kind of your duty as a photographer obviously if there's like a thousand people there maybe it's impossible or maybe you need to bring a bigger team uh, but for most of my weddings, 100 to 200 people, uh, I think it's very easy to include everyone in either a group shot or during cocktails. Um, if your second photographer goes around and just gets people to smile and face the camera in the small little groups they're hanging out in, uh, I feel like there's also a lot of value in that as well. With the groom side, um, same deal as bride side, optional if you have good light and you have the time, just individuals quickly with everyone, so groom and all of his, his guys and family as well. You can also get a little bit ahead of the family shots. I'll always reshoot this, so even if I do a family shot of the bride and, and her 
parents at this time, I'm still going to reshoot it to fit the continuity of the rest of the day or the rest of the family photos. Uh, but I have no issue doing kind of a few different versions of that and also a few different versions with the bride and her mom only and the bride and her dad only, um, just to make sure that I just kind of capture as many possible photos of kind of the key members of the day as possible. Moving into the first look, um, it's there's a number of ways to do it and also a first look in itself is completely optional. Um, usually what I do before they see each other is that if somebody is, usually the way that I structure it is somebody's approaching someone else. So I would be standing here like this facing you, the camera, and then someone would be coming up kind of over my shoulder. So if I am the only photographer, usually what I'm doing is I'm grabbing a quick shot of them coming down from over here first to make sure that I grab that and then I'm spinning around and getting the opposite side so from their perspective over there looking at me if you have two photographers it's very easy to to make that happen very quickly and that's kind of I guess like the, the the basics to it I would say that it's kind of it's a little bit different every time and it really is just kind of however it ends up happening uh, and again just kind of being there to document the process uh, I do usually once they see each other they'll have a legitimately nice moment for a little while. I don't try to interrupt that until they start to feel awkward and then usually they start looking around for me like, what do we do now? Um, and at that point, usually I just have them arm around each other, smile, face the camera. And again, getting that key photo that everyone's gonna be very upset if you don't get it, which is just the full length, boring, arm around each other, smile, face the camera. Um, at this point, there are a few different variations of things that you can do if you wish. Um, if there's family around, you can start with the family photos. You can, in some cases, we get all of the family photos done at this point. Uh, you can do bridal party photos. You can do individuals with each of the bridal party people. You can do as much as you possibly can. Um, a lot of my couples really over the past five or six years have all been super passionate about getting as many of the photos done in the section of the day as possible. For myself as a photographer, the struggle, I guess, overall is that it's usually kind of that 12 noon light, so it's by no means the best time, but you can find a tree kind of like we did today, maybe a little better tree or maybe a little more bounce kind of under my chin here to light up my eyes. But uh, overall, like you can find a spot and you can get it done. And if you just don't get the shots that you need, you can always just redo them. So maybe during the sunset session, you bring the bridal party out to do a quick bridal party photo. Uh, if you feel like maybe the quality is 90% there, but you're not 100% happy with it, um, that there are always options and ways that you can modify the day to make sure you're basically just doing your 100% best all day. Moving into the ceremony, I'm very documentary based, which means that it's just kind of as everything happens, I don't pose anything, I don't do anything, I don't move anything. Uh, walking in, kind of same deal as before, that you want to make sure you get that venue shot first and foremost, that you want that transition shot for the gallery, and if you're doing a video, you want that that new location shot as well um, and then same deal as before like anything that has been brought in by the couple you want to make sure that you're documenting that uh, usually if I have a second photographer and say for instance this is we're at a church as the bride or whoever's arriving in, in some sort of wedding vehicle as they're arriving I'll have my second out there to make sure that that moments documented uh, and then I'm kind of inside as a safety because sometimes they just like as the as the bride's car is arriving they actually just start the ceremony and if you're outside trying to grab that um, you might miss the beginning of that with like the family coming down the aisle so I'm kind of the safety human down there and then I send my second out to get that um, but again it's kind of all as things happen um, I do my best to get as many candidates at this time as well um, it's pretty obvious who the official kind of immediate family is at this point that everyone that's kind of the closest and that you've seen throughout the getting ready stages grab as many candidates of them as you possibly can and when people are in good light I usually just hover around that area so if there's if I know that the the church the venue is like really terrible lighting or pot lights or just really strange mix sometimes like church white balances are just crazy um, so if I know that that's gonna be the situation there I do my best to make sure I get as many photos as I possibly can in good light so everyone's looking their best and I don't have to spend too long in, in Lightroom afterwards trying to figure it out and then eventually just converting everything to black and white because that's the only way to salvage that uh, so when there's good light really take advantage of it and get as many of the candidates as you possibly can during the ceremony there are lots of my videos on YouTube right now that you can actually just watch most of the ceremonies I let them run pretty much kind of full length for the time that we're we're taking photos uh, so you can watch those the the main thing that I would recommend is to get yourself a zoom lens of some sort you'll see that I am pretty much every single time on a 70 to 200. So I, I just have enough zoom to, to get around and to get the moments and to 
to get the speakers if somebody comes up and they're only going to say three sentences and I'm at the far back of the church that I can kind of get halfway and bef- without like running to the front that I can actually zoom in to, to make sure that I get that shot. So I would say that that's something that's important for me as they're exiting, um, same deal, 7200, and as they're walking back towards me, uh, I'm very conscious and aware that at some point, usually there's a door and they're gonna go out that door. So I'm doing my best to either beat them out that door and switch to my second camera body, which is going to be a 24 millimeter lens and get that wide shot of them exiting, uh, or I'm going to do the transition shot of them kind of heading towards the door and the back of them, uh, which also works as well. And again, kind of back to those storytelling elements that it's something that really does kind of add a lot overall to your gallery. After the ceremony, I am doing the standard portraits of the couple together. I do the full length that I've talked about several times. I'm just really trying to hammer it home and and don't forget that, as well as kind of three quarter lengths. Um, Another key one here that you should absolutely get is the shot of the back of the dress as well. And if there is dress, like just make sure it's as, as big as it can be and laid out properly. It's worth it for that one photo. And same deal, they can either have an arm around each other or holding hands and facing away from the camera. But that would, I would say, ranks maybe in the top five of other kind of critical important shots that you should get at a wedding day. Um, I'm also going to be doing a few photos of just the the bride and the groom alone at this point as well. Um, And usually we do that kind of in the same environment. So we'll do some couples photos and then I'll just have like one of them pivot this way and I'll just shoot with a background that doesn't include the other person. Um, Again, trying to make it as easy as I possibly can on my couple. Uh, And then moving into the bridal party, usually the the basics, I guess, um, they're on the checklist, but it's pretty much everybody all at once so the full full bridal party including kids then remove the kids and then usually i go for um, i start with kids specifically because you're they're usually ready to go by that point um so if they're in good spirits do those photos get them on their way and then do a photo with the couple and the kids of ring bearers or um, flower girls or whoever they might be um at that point i send the kids off and i do photos just with the bride side or um, groom side kind of individually um, with just them and then also as a couple and then if i haven't gotten it uh, before in good light when we were kind of getting ready i also do individuals so the bride and each of her girls groom each of his guys um, and then optional sometimes my second photographer will do this that as people are released so if we were if i'm not doing photos with the guys anymore that my second photographer will do individual portraits with each of the guys or each of the girls um, just to have something i feel like it's it's a good use of time um, rather than just kind of sniping candidates, which are, are great, but to have that one nice photo of everyone, I feel like it, it has a purpose for, for everyone. Like everyone's mom's gonna want that to put on their wall or whatever. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a valuable investment of time, I think. And then the other thing, I guess, is uh, depending on how, how you structure your day, that that second photographer could also head back to cocktail hour right now, and they could be doing all those photos, um, candidates as well as getting people to smile and face the camera. So it kind of comes down to you what you think is a better use of time for me I personally have my second if there's any sort of distance involved which means that I have to go somewhere with the with the bridal party if we have to separate like that usually my second will go to cocktails um, and they will also do a full round of candidates in the um, or a full round of details in the actual reception venue as well uh, hopefully before everyone starts arriving into the wedding venue uh, which is another thing that like you want to get that shot of the of the room just empty and sometimes your second photographer is able to get that if uh if you can't and now moving into family photos again it is so helpful to have just that list of family photos from the couple that you know that this is the list these are the 15 photos that they want even if it's like 50 photos i don't mind if it's outlined that means that the scope creep of the session is going to stay as minimal as possible that no aunt's going to come in and start directing the day that like hey we'll get to that shot during cocktails because i have a list right here um, so that's usually kind of my my escape from that if uh, things start getting too out of control overall um, and then on the checklist is just kind of all the basic combinations that I would do but again lots of families are very different so make sure that you know what that family if there's any difficult dynamics that you have to know about make sure that you know about that maybe in the the first or second meeting or even just like the phone call leading up to the wedding day um, so that you don't accidentally put two people like if it's a separated family and those parents do not get along and they will not be in a photo together you don't want to be the one calling that out and by having a list usually you can avoid that Uh, and usually if it's a situation like that the the couple will actually inform you prior and they're not going to just let you figure that out on the actual wedding day Um, you can probably also feel that out on the wedding day too Um, if they haven't told you usually there's some some tells in there if you're if you're paying attention 
moving to cocktails um if my second's out doing that it's just candidates of guests again trying to get that one good candid photo of every single person that's there which is a bit of a task sometimes uh as well as if they're cool with it just those small group photos um if a, uh, like a little small family's hanging out just walk over to them and ask them hey mind if i take a quick photo for the bride and groom uh and they're usually pretty happy to oblige that uh and then at some point sometimes families will be like oh yeah and can you also do like a little family portrait of us and then at that point now they're in the gallery they're going to find that gallery they're going to like you as a photographer even though it was your second photographer and they are actually going to maybe refer you in the future or book you for a family session or whatever it might be um so i think there's lots of opportunities there um just by doing couples photos of everybody just kind of like around hanging out as well um, moving into the reception, as I mentioned, that it's very nice if you're able to get that empty room photo. Sometimes your second photographer has to do that empty room photo, which is totally fine. Um, but any decor, any details that come in, obviously like the cake, and um, it's, it's all on the checklist. And as we go uh, into people doing things, speeches, just capturing everyone and also being very aware of candid photo opportunities you can kind of sense when people are leading up to a joke and usually at that point i'm ready to capture a candid of somebody in the immediate family or the bride and the groom um, so that i'm able to just kind of get as many again candids as possible that's how i kind of sell myself as a candid photographer overall and the more that i can just kind of deliver on that the happier i am overall and then the last section of the checklist sunset session do one uh, that just means to get out and to make sure that you actually coach your, or at least mention it in the first meeting and then leading up to the wedding they're going they're, they'll have in their mind that, that you'll be doing a sunset session of some sort and then typically I would say that when you're actually putting the schedule together just mention like you're not going to be obtrusive like if they're in the middle of like eating their dinner like you're not just going to drag them out because it's like the proper time that you'll give them warning and you'll just kind of play it by whatever's happening. If it's cloudy, it's gonna change it a little bit. If it's a sunset, we're, we're gonna go out and try to get that. Or even in some cases, like blue hour is really nice as well, depending on the venue. If you're downtown in a city, that nice blue hour might actually be the, the time that you'd wanna bring them out. So there's lots of different variations to that, but I would say that I get a lot of my favorite photos from that time of the day. So yeah, download it. It's in the link in the description, head over there and, and get, the, get the checklist, modify it if you want print it out as it is if you want. And remember, if you're interested in getting all of my courses, uh, that there are 100 spots available at the founder rate, which is $6.58 per month if you sign up for the annual, which is absolutely crazy. There are $2,000 plus of stuff already there, including all of my presets, including my off-camera flash guide for wedding photographers, as well as introvert's guide to, to wedding photography posing. And there's, there's so much on there. Click over there and have a look at what you could potentially be getting. Uh, everything's kind of separated into three columns. First column being, the skills that you actually need to, to get into wedding photography and to really kind of make your photos next level. The second column is just all the business element of things, um, all the Book More Weddings courses and a lot more content in there as far as pricing goes and um, connecting with your ideal clients. And then the third pillar is learning to travel and use your camera to actually generate free and paid travel opportunities, which I feel like is awesome for everyone. Uh, it's the reason that I got into wedding photography was simply for the time freedom that it allows. And rather than working nine to five, Monday to Friday, now I work kind of Saturdays and the rest of my life is a little bit more customizable. I like to use a lot of that time to travel. And if you're interested in that as well, um, there's a lot of opportunities out there and probably even more opportunities than you could ever imagine this year um, with the, the dip in the travel industry. Um, on the other side of that, there's going to be a lot of opportunities. So if you start getting your skills to where they need to be now, and by skills, I, I basically just mean email skills. A lot of it's just like making your own opportunities happen, uh, that you already have the skills required to do it and you already have the gear required to do it. So it's really just kind of the steps of actually getting in contact with people and, and doing those deals to get you at, I would say at the beginning, uh, break even travel so you're not paying money to go out and do a new experience and see a new place uh, and then eventually flipping that to actually being paid to, to go out there into the world and to see new places and do unique and interesting things and, and come home a little bit of a paycheck thanks so much for watching see you again tomorrow probably not from the park though i'll probably go somewhere else